the, so we worked uh, with guinea pigs. But at the same time, when I had been a postdoc in Baruch's lab at New York University, I had come across a paper by another very eminent immunologist, uh, Richard Dutton. Uh, I don't know if Dick was a president. His wife may have been, uh, Susie Swain. I think Susie was, a, you may have the list, I don't know. But Dick was in that era in London, and he had reported that he could take cells from rabbit lymph nodes and uh, expose them to certain stimulants in vitro and then measure their response by their synthesis of DNA using the uptake of tritiated thymine. And I read this paper, and it really said, this is terrific. And I immediately started doing it in our system. So I could now study the things we had been limited to study before in animals. I could study them in not petri dishes, but little culture. And it was transformative. And it really, today, of course, the technology is not used quite the same way. But fundamentally, we all still do the same thing. We culture lymphocytes. Uh, in tissue culture, uh, expose them to what we believe to be their cognate antigens, and then manipulate them in various ways. And then once we know that, what, what controls that, we find, try to f understand fundamentally what's happening. Now, of course, what's happened in modern science is we've recognized that in vitro can be misleading. So you always have to refer back to the animal. But in that era, we'd been always referring to the animal. And now we had a chance to get a better picture of what was going on. So we relied exceedingly heavily on the in vitro stuff. And it was somewhat later, again, technology made it possible for us to fold that back into animals. So I would say we did both. We worked with whole animals, and we worked in tissue culture. And <clears throat> half your day was spent following uh, Baruch's line of inquiry, and then the other half. I wouldn't say half the day, but you know, part. You so know. my question is, uh, were, the, were the, your own projects coordinated with his, or were you following separate lines? Or not? Well, so there was a. Again, this is uh, Baruch's dead now, so he can't be he can't be offended, and I would never want to offend him. He was really re quite remarkable and wonderful to me, but. There, you know, all of us have our little foibles. So uh, we had been together at New York University. And then um, I had met uh, a man named Av Mitchison, who was one of the great figures uh, in uh, British immunology. And Av and Brooke knew each other quite well. And we recognized we were going to move from New York City to Bethesda. So Av and Brooke worked it out that I'd go and spend two or three months in Av's laboratory uh, in London um, just before the move. Which, so we went as a family. And um, let's see, why did I tell the story? Oh, yeah, so when I was there, um, I got to see what Av was doing. And he was doing what I thought were just unbelievably beautiful experiments, working out the notion that there was cooperation between two different types of lymphocytes. So in Baruch's lab, we had understood that the determination of whether an animal could respond to an antigen and the actual specificity of the response were two separately regulated functions. And we understood this, and we, but we spoke about it in really in a sort of a theoretical construct. But Av had actually done it in an experiment. He had realized that that was so. And one cell did this, and one cell did that. And to the elements of specificity were, if you like, segregated to different cells. And you could physically get a hold of them and do experiment. And it was just astounding. So when I returned from London, I said to Baruch, um, I want to do that. You know, that's what I like to do for my own work, to we'll follow up on what Av had done. I thought it was just magnificent. And Brooke said, that's good, that's fine. Um, and this is what we'll do together. And then, of course, uh, um, 
I started working on it, and a lot of good results started coming. And Brew got very interested. <laughs> and he said, oh, you know, we had a, a technician who had worked with us at NYU, had come with us to Bethesda, and he was working with Brew. And he said, well, you know, Edmund can help you. <laughs> and then one of the postdocs came on. He said, well, David can help you, too. <laughs> and so in the end, when we published this paper, we we're all of us on it, which was fine. But, it, but I must say, Baruch never put his name on a paper that he didn't deserve to be on. Never. His contributions were always very clear. In fact, there was a, the great frustration for a young person like myself working in this setting was not that he was unfairly putting his name on my papers. That was never the case. But that his intellect was so strong that, you, you know, it was hard to establish your own true independence in a setting of that sort where you're always talking all the time. Where was his, where did his ideas end and mine begin and vice versa? Well, who could tell? Um, so he helped me by going to Harvard and then that was over with. So I loved the time and I endured working with him, but I was getting a little, an as you like, antsy because I was beginning to feel, you know, I wasn't completely able to establish my own stuff, although we did. The, the, I'm always stating it a bit, and as I said, I probably wouldn't say this if he was alive to hear it, because he had been wonderful to me. And, uh, and it really isn't a complaint, it's so much the true reality of how um, science is done, you know, and he was always there, always interested, always excited. So um, that's sort of a story that came, we got it from that, from whole animals and tissue culture. So I guess we, we wandered, we wandered a bit, as they say. <laughs>